God bless you today. We are turning our attention to Acts chapter number two. It is indeed the seminal passage, the most significant passage in Christendom today all across the world. The church universal is literally sitting in this season of Pentecost. Pentecost is uh, particularly described in the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, if you will, as the birth of the church. It is the time where the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 uh, individuals who were so compelled by their experience with Jesus, so compelled by his resurrection, so compelled by the mission they were being invited to carry out that they followed Jesus' admonition and told themselves, we're going to head to Jerusalem and hang out in an upper room, in a room that was elevated, and we're going to just lock ourselves in. It was the ultimate shut-in. Amen. Some of us who've grown up in some old school churches may remember uh, all-night prayer meeting. Anybody ever been to all-night prayer meeting? Amen. Where you was just there all night long, and if you was in the 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 right or wrong sanctified church, amen, they would have a three-day prayer meeting, amen, and, you know, back in the day, you, you wouldn't even worry about going home to take a shower, or nothing, you just was all caught up in the spirit, now, today, they at least let you go home and, you know, freshen on up, praise God, but it was indeed an act of spiritual fervor uh, that has literally, in the modern age, since uh, 1906, it has become what anthropologists describe, along with Islam and hip-hop, to be one of the three fastest-growing social movements in the world. There are more people uh, really leaning into this sensibility that God is open to pouring out God's Spirit on all of us. Amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, that means me, praise God, that I am included in the all of us, and so we uh, are now in a season, several Sundays, we'll try to unpack Pentecost, what it means, what it invites us as God's people, certainly as the church, uh, to do in a season and time where we are in need more than ever before of an outpour of God's Spirit. Did you have me sing a song that says, we need an outpour of the Spirit, send it down. Send it down in me, send it down in us. So Acts chapter number two will be where we start. Uh, just in case some of us may have forgotten or may not have heard, the book of Acts is uh, Luke, the gospel of Luke part two. It is the continuation of Luke's account of the works of Jesus as he received them in eyewitness testimony being scribed uh, by the uh, Apostle Paul, who received uh, the, the kind of download of this experience of Jesus. I'm sure Paul saw much of this with his own eyes, and yet uh, Paul, for some weeks, spent time in Jerusalem after he was knocked off of his horse on the road to Damascus on his way to go persecute Christians. The Apostle Paul spent time and got more of this uh, fuller story. And so the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, is, uh, as the writer says, the greatest attempt to tell the story of Jesus to the Greek audiences who were not necessarily Jewish. And the book of Acts then is the continuation of the Gospel of Luke declaring the acts of the apostles, the actions, the next steps of the followers of Jesus in the aftermath of the gospel, the life of Jesus. And so we are picking up here in Acts chapter number two, verse number one. We'll do a little bit of reading here just to give us a full sense of what we hope to talk about today. The scripture says in verse number one, Acts chapter number two, that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Everybody say, all together in one place. And suddenly, somebody say, suddenly, suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. I want you to just imagine, amen, what... Uh, Violent wind sounds like, and then you feel it 
filling the entire house. Amen. Oh, that wasn't just good timing. Amen. I was like, Lord, have mercy. Is the Amen. I'm ready, Lord. Do it again. Amen. I'm open. I'm open. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't have the ham and orgy back then. I just want y'all to know. So, but yes, three verse number three. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. A supernatural occurrence happened when they were all together in one place, uh, in one space, and. The scripture says all of them, verse number four, were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, verse number five, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound and at this sound of them literally uh, speaking in other languages, I want you to imagine you're in a in a in a in a in a town and you're in a walking by and all of a sudden you hear gibberish, praise God. Just at the top of the line, 120 people, ain't just one person, 120 people just going at it. The scripture says, at this sound, the crowd began to gather and was bewildered. Why? Because each one of them heard them speaking in their native language of each. So I want you to appreciate this. They're all minding their own business, 120 folks uh, in an upper uh, kind of home, in a, in a, in a village, in, the, in, in Jerusalem rather, and folks are just walking by and they're hearing all this loud, loud gibberish. But because each one of them are from a particular part of Jerusalem, they all have a different dialect, they all begin to kind of hone in a little bit more and say, man, I'm hearing my own language in the midst of the gibberish. Lord, have mercy. That, you know, that, 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 may, that may not, you know, be, uh, be very significant to many of us because many of us, we only speak one language. Amen. So, you know, it don't, it don't, it don't mean much, but it's, it's important to appreciate that still in certain parts of this part of the world, folks are multilingual. They have dialects that are only unique to certain parts of their region. And so can you imagine being in a place where they don't speak your dialect and all of a sudden you hear your dialect and it's proclaiming, the scripture says, the good news. Verse number seven said, amazed and astonished, the crowd asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed. How many have ever been amazed by God and perplexed at the same time? Now, that's a move of God, isn't it? It's like, God, I'm amazed, but I'm confused. <laughs> that's how you know God is moving, when you're amazed and confused at the same time. They began crying, to, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and Address them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Peter saying, we don't drink this early. Come back and see us later, right? No, I'm going dis to disavow you of some bad assumptions. No, this is that which the apostle prophet Joel proclaimed in verse number 17 in the last days. It will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my servants, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So the sermon today is simply, this is Pentecost. Amen. Let's pray. God, we say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us 
Your people on Pentecost Sunday, I pray that your spirit will continue to be poured out among us, that it would well up within us, that it would sustain us, and that we will grow by this word today to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless the preacher and bless the preaching. We hide behind your cross. May the anointing that makes both preaching and teaching easy rest on me. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. I love verse number 17. <clears throat> Many of you always know I refer to this particularly regularly because it is important to keep reminding ourselves. As the scripture says that in the last day, God is active among all of us. The scripture says God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. And the specificity of such a passage, again, is often lost upon us because we are used to these distinctions. Because we are a society that has been forced to realize difference as both a distinguishing factor. Sometimes it is used as a mode of oppression. Sometimes it is used as a way to measure our progress, to introduce equity, to make sure that fairness and justice is being evenly applied. But I want you to appreciate that the scripture, this particular passage uh, prophesied by Joel, likely in the eighth or ninth century before the Christian era. This is a thousands year old prophecy, a proclamation that God made in a time when the social stratification of difference was rigid. Meaning that there was a distinct hierarchical relationship between men and women, slaves or servants and the free the rich and the poor, that that was a, a, a description of society that everybody knew there was something that differentiated us from one another. Some folk had more privilege. Some folk had more advantages. Some folk had more social status. This prophecy, thousands of years old, God was putting a seed in the religious soil of the Judeo-Christian tradition. That although we live in a world that is contaminated by difference and division, a day is coming that is initiated by the Holy Spirit where all flesh is going to have equal access to the God of all creation. Woo! I want you to know, amen, that just because things don't live up to the ideal of the proclamation, it does not mean God is not mindful and actively at work. Pushing and prodding we who claim to follow Jesus to lean into a more faithful expression of what God's original intent has always been. Because how many of you know that it is our assumption, our presupposition, it is our, uh, you know, working theorem, if you will, that when God created everything, God created everything in harmony with one another. And it is the fallen nature of creation, the rebellious impulses of creation that have turned God's harmonious world into great uh, opposition. And God has for at least thousands of years through the, the telling of this Christian redemption story been inviting you and I to be a part of God putting it back together again. Whew. I want you to know that God is inviting us to be part of God's redemptive work in the world. God is not just asking you to pay your fee like you're going to watch the Warriors and you sit there in the audience watching the game happen on the court. 
I know for some of us, that's how we are socialized into Christian faith. Perhaps this is a spectator sport, and I'm just here to watch the preacher and the musicians and the singers and, and, and you know, from time to time, the kids, praise God. I, I'm just there to watch them do the religious stuff, but I don't have no real investment in the redemptive work of God in the world. But don't you know when Jesus left the world, the scripture says that his disciples had a mission they were supposed to do, but rather than going to do the mission, the scripture says they all stood up looking in the clouds. Jesus leaves and the scripture says they stand in there watching. Amen. And some, some heavenly beings, some angels had to show up and say, why are you standing here gazing when you got work to do? Anybody ever had an encounter with Jesus and you know you got an assignment, but you get locked in the aftermath of your revelatory experience. Rather than doing your assignment, you get stuck in paralysis gazing. Gazing at the trouble, gazing at the problems, gazing at the lost hope. And God has to again give you a supernatural shake up to remind you that you're not meant to be a gazer. Is that even a word? I don't know. Some of y'all, is that a, that's a word? Praise God. Man, because I feel, I feel a little, little creative this morning. You're not meant to be a gazer. You are meant to be a participator in God's redemptive work in the world. And that's why the scripture says, in the last day, all flesh will get an uh, uh, invitation into this spirit. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That means that issues of gender are now made obsolete when it comes to access to the spirit. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your age is no longer an issue. On your slaves or servants, both men and women. So now, even your status socially, whether you are incarcerated, whether you are undocumented, whether you are in jail, coming home from jail, never been to jail, it don't matter. None of that becomes the prerequisite for our invitation into the salvific work of God in the world. And I believe on a day like today in a time in which we live where violence and death and division has been unleashed in the world in a way that feels unprecedented, at least in our generation, God is still inviting some of us into the redemptive, reparative work of creation. That our Pentecostal assignment, if you will, is not to have just good church on Sunday, to build spiritual fervor in the 10 to 12, two hour delineated time at 1305 University. And then we check that box. No, God invites you and I into God's redemptive work beyond the building, beyond the church service. God is inviting us into a Pentecostal lifestyle. And this is why the act of Pentecost, the event of Pentecost, is the culmination of God's work salvifically in the life, the presence, the ministry of Jesus. For if the crucifixion was to our human sensibilities an act of psychological terror that was meted out by the states, resurrection was the neutralizer, the reversal of psychological terror. Resurrection reminds us that even though death is real, resurrection is just as real. Even though death may be ubiquitous, resurrection is all-consuming. It undoes the terror, the death that we often have to engage, but resurrection 
does not give you and I the spiritual investment that the spirit is seeking to do in our lives. The scripture says it like this. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now seeks to raise us from the dead. The Holy Spirit, Pentecost then, is God's down payment in the life of the Christ follower to make sure that you always got a lot of Jesus walking around with you every day. Hello, somebody. Amen. I'm talking about, you know, a lot of Jesus. The scripture says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Not, not you know, they dipped their toe in it. <laughs> not that, you know, oh, I caught the Holy Ghost today, and when I leave church, then, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I, I wrestled out of the Holy Ghost's grasp. No, the scripture describes it as on the day of Pentecost, they were gathered together and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand, child of God, that when the Holy Spirit comes, it comes with fire. Now, fire for many of us is not something we like to play with. At least you are not. They have a name for you who do. And it is not a complimentary name. Matter of fact, if you are someone who loves to play with fire, literally, figuratively, or otherwise, amen, you are someone who is usually described as a uh, risky, high-risk person. But I want you to know that God wants to invite you into a risky, high-risk spirituality Amen. where you are taking some risk to get beyond the limitations of your current spiritual status. Because when fire comes, fire purifies us. Fire illuminates us. Fire brings warmth and it consumes us. I love in scripture how fire is often used, particularly uh, in the tabernacle, in the Jewish kind of understanding of the way uh, the, 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 the altars in the tabernacle. The scripture says that they, the priest lit a fire and it never was to go out. And so someone was always on guard making sure that fire was burning in the tabernacle as an expressed presence of God among the people well guess what you and I are now the tabernacles you are the tabernacle of God and everywhere you go you ought to have fire burning in you through you, but not burning you out. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. That the fire must require some consistent uh, feeding and fueling in order to cultivate it and keep it going. And this is what I love about Pentecost is that it invites you and I into the universal challenge that we are called to be filled with the spirit and then live our life in such a way that the fire never runs out. How does Pentecost happen? Well, I want you to appreciate, child of God, that we have a wonderful description of what Pentecost looks like in Scripture and in history. We go to the text and we see that they were all gathered together in one place under one roof. And they were literally in prayer and waiting for God to show up. I want you to remind yourself that the best experience of the God of creation happens when we wait for God together in unity. It is not to suggest that God does not visit us when we by ourselves, but I want you to appreciate that your faith, our faith is never meant to be lived out in isolation. That we, everybody say we, we are God's people. You by yourself can't be God's people. You can be one of God's people. 
but we are God's people and the way the Holy Spirit shows up among God's people is when we are together in one place living out a unified way of life that the Holy Spirit at its best calls you and I invites you and I to unity somebody holler the invitation to unity This is what the scripture says, that they were all together in one place. It is an invitation for you and I to prioritize being together. And the unity has levels to it. Now, this is a hard thing for, I believe, the American church, the Western church, because the expression of church in the West has been literally contaminated by disunity, by difference, by oppression in the name of a God who calls us into unity. And so the best way to live out this mandate in the global church is to practice it first among ourselves. How do you and I work together to promote unity? Now, unity and uniformity are not the same things. You and I can be in unity, but we need not require uniformity. Your body works in unity, but it is not uniformity. You have differentiation within your body. Some of us ought to be glad about that, amen? Not all of us, not all of your body is an eye. Not all of your body is a nose. Not all of your body is a foot. Your body has differentiation, but the unity, the coordination, the the collaboration of your body makes you a functional organism. And when your body is not in unity, oftentimes you have to go to the doctor. And you got to let the doctor help create some equilibrium. I want you to appreciate that there are some practices that can help us figure out how we can be in better unity. Listen, that is literally sparked by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because our unity must be an outgrowth of God's spirit. We can be unified, but not necessarily through the spirit, through the principles, the power of God's spirit. And that is why the scripture is inviting you and I into the practices that create unity, prayer, easy practice, yet not regularly done in community. But when we learn to pray together, we learn to experience God together. When we fast together, we learn to literally have this aesthetic uh, or ascetic, A-S-C-E-T-I-C. It is the word that describes how monks and nuns and priests and these spiritual saints, they literally pulled away from society and they lived out in these rural parts of the countryside and spent all day and night and weeks and months engaging in spiritual practices. Why? Because they felt like there are moments in my life where I got to literally engage with God much more deeply than I do in my kind of everyday life. Has anybody ever had a season where you realize work is a barrier to my spiritual engagement with God? (laughs) My family obligations are a barrier to my deep spiritual engagements with God. My physical limitations, my my stresses. And and so, God, I need to take some time out and just sit with God. Let God work on me. Let God speak to me. Let God capture my attention. 
You see, this invitation into unity is part of an outgrowth of our collective disciplines. And this whole year, we've been talking about spiritual disciplines. We've been talking about the need for us to literally engage in more prayer, more study, more uh, 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 fasting, more acts of service, more uh, uh, moments where we are doing meditation and reflection. All disciplines that literally put our body collectively in spiritual alignment with God. On a day like today, When Pentecost is being celebrated, I want us to not lose fact that the way Pentecost came was when they were all together in one place. The Pentecost, even though it impacted them individually, it was prefaced by their collective unity. So one question I have for you is, what is getting in the way of our collective unity? What gets in the way of us spending time waiting for God? One of the, one of the most uh, uh, interesting expressions of Pentecostal spirituality, unbeknownst to many, uh, took place in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, leading into the Zusa revivals of the 1906. There were folks that were named Quakers. And they would gather together in a circle. And the scripture, or not the scripture, their experience was to read a scripture, and rather than having a preacher preach, they all would simply reflect on the scripture collectively together, listen, and they would just wait. Sometimes it would be minutes, sometimes it would be hours, but they would just wait until they felt the presence of God show up. And they became known as Quakers because their bodies literally began to quake and shake. And their testimony was their heart felt strangely warmed. When was the last time your heart got strangely warmed? Your body started to quake. You started to have a physical expression and manifestation of God's presence in the collective waiting. We try to initiate such an experience week to week through our times of worship, our times of singing, our times of prayer. But I want you to know that Pentecost is the highest, most potent moment where the church has experienced the collective pouring out of God's spirit and everybody. Scripture says began to experience this spiritual manifestation of God's presence. What would it look like, people of the way, if we prioritized this kind of unity? It would mean more than us just having good church on Sunday. It would mean that wherever we went, we would have some unity of purpose, of action, of function, of impact, whether we're in the neighborhood, in the schoolhouse, in our homes, at the university, on your job, walking through the park, that the unity of the spirit would be at work. And guess what? The best part of this is there are some other folks in other churches and other places that are also tapped into the same spirit. And so it's almost like you and I can be literally walking through the world and through life fueled by the same power of the living God. And this is what Pentecost invites you and I to, that as we gain more unity, listen, the unity then begins to create the, the, the diversity of communications and experience. Now, the scripture says, again, that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they all began to speak with other languages. Now, you know, in the most traditional act of Pentecostal spirituality, you know, speaking in tongues is often kind of used in ways that freak people out. 
folks be like, I don't know. I see them speaking in tongues, I get real uncomfortable. Someone tell Pastor, I don't know. It's, you know, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I ain't going to do that. I'm not interested in that part. But I want you to appreciate that there are at least three ways you need to be open and imagining the way the Holy Spirit gives you new language. One of the first ways you need new language, the scripture says, that they begin to hear the good news of God in languages that other people could understand. There is a need today for some interpretive Christ-following people in the world. Some folk can't hear the good news because it's been so contaminated and misrepresented. And so whenever you mention the word Jesus, the ways of Jesus, people's lives have been so impacted by the miseducation of of Jesus Christ. Amen. That they need you to be a new language. Somebody holler new language. Your life needs to be a new language. There's some folk who can't hear, but they can see. Your life needs to be a new interpretive description of the goodness of God, of the faithfulness of God, of the relevancy of salvation. And everywhere you go, listen, everywhere God has you placed, it is a, 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 uh, it's a, it's an opportunity for you to think about how can I describe in a new language to those whose ear is attuned to their dialect. It may be in a tech space. It may be in an academic space. It may be in a space that is uh, dominated by uh, the economic uh, dialect. It may be in a cultural space. It may be in a generational space. It may be in the neighborhood. It may be in the hospital. But God is inviting you to find new language. Listen, that is given to you by the ability of the spirit. The Spirit gives you the ability to have the language to translate the goodness of God to people around you who can't hear it from the preacher. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody today who can't hear it from the evangelical church, who can't hear it from the Western church. They need a new language to help them understand that God is pouring out God's Spirit on all flesh. Uh, you you need to have a language uh, that is known in, in the Greek. It's called glossolalia. So the language to make God's words known to those in the human space. But then there is a language that lets you have ability to pray in a way that only you and God. Your spirit communicates with God. That you have the ability through the power of the spirit to speak as the scripture says in moanings and groanings and utterances and words that only God can understand. Uh, someone say, why do I need to pray in that way? Uh, it is only because there's some things going on in your life uh, that you know you can't even put it into full words. Uh, anybody ever had something happening in, and your words just failed you? And so you get down there in a place of prayer and you start to realize that, God, I need to communicate with you on a whole nother level. I need your spirit to initiate a way of communication that begins to penetrate the reality of my life. And God invites you then into a place of supernatural experiences Uh, uh and I want you to know child of God that you and I need a good supernatural encounter with God from time to time You and I need to be able to have a touch from God uh, that you can't get from your boo or from your teacher or from your job. You you need to get a touch from God that that causes you to feel different uh, uh, without you having to go anywhere. Uh, You need a touch. Lord, I wish I had somebody uh, who could be honest. 
honest about, God, if you can just touch me, touch me in the deepest part of my life uh, when all hell is breaking loose and God I don't have a fire hose to put out this hell uh, I don't have a trap door to get out of this situation uh, I don't have the strength to make it through this trial uh, but God I know that if I can just call on your name there's a power of the Holy Ghost uh, that has the ability to touch me, uh, that has the ability to move me, uh, that has the ability to empower me, uh, that can speak to my heart uh, in a way that nobody else can. Uh, it is a prayer language. Uh, it don't have to sound a certain way. Uh, it don't have to look a certain way. Uh, it's just your way to communicate with God. Uh, and all through the last hundred years, uh, you've had people all over the world, uh, all over the cultural spectrum, uh, people that are rich or poor, uh, people that are learned or unlearned, uh, people that are wealthy and affluent, uh, people that are in the government or in the streets. Uh, they've all had a common experience uh, that God, I need to be included uh, on the last day uh, when your spirit will be poured out on all flesh. I need to have a language that helps me pierce the darkness, that cuts through the ugliness, that gives me the strength to keep moving forward. Somebody shout hallelujah. And there's another language that you need to be able to engage. And that's just the ability to speak those things that are not as though they are. The language to prophesy, to speak boldly, to foretell the goodness of the Lord. I may not be able to speak in your language. I may not be able to speak in a heavenly tongue, but I'm able to wake up every day and say that this is the day that victory comes to my house. This is the day that justice comes to my community. This is the day that I got the power of the living God moving, working, flowing. And on a day like today, fill me up. Let me overflow. I wanted to run over. I wanted to run over. Don't give me a drip drop, but turn on the faucet. Drench me. Cover me. Fill me up. Let me have it. I want to be full. This is Pentecost. Somebody shout hallelujah. And such an experience of Pentecost is literally set before us not just today, but every day. Every day we are being invited to be filled with the Spirit. And as the sermonic selection said, I want the Spirit to speak to my heart, speak to my mind, speak to my spirit, speak to my soul, speak to my circumstance. And I don't want to have to wait for Pastor Mike or Pastor Tanisha to deliver a word of encouragement Sunday to Sunday when I have access to the same spirit. That if I need a word from the Lord on a Tuesday evening at 1.30 in the morning, don't call Pastor Mike, praise God. <laughs> I mean, you can try, <laughs> but I trust God enough that when I don't answer, <laughs> you can holler out to the Lord and you'll get a better bang for your buck anyhow. Somebody say amen. I love it. The book of Numbers chapter 11, the scripture reminds us that Moses gathered all the people together. This is the Jewish scripture, the Old Testament passage. And the scripture says that the Lord came down in a cloud, took some of the spirit that was on Moses, and he 
spread it to some of the other priests. Two of the priests, Eldad and Medad, started to prophesy in the camp. And some of the haters in the group, they got jealous and upset with them on behalf of Moses. Like, hey, only Moses can do that. <laughs> Moses, hearing the controversy, he says to them, hey, I wish that all of you would prophesy. All of you had that boldness, that clarity, accepted the invitation. Why? Because it is an open invitation for all of us to experience Pentecost. And this is the day across all of Church Universal where we remind ourselves that in the last day, God said he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Stand with me, everybody. Let's just take a moment, close your eyes, lift up those hands to the Lord and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for the experience of the infilling of your spirit. I need that violent wind to come and shake some things in my life. I need the fire to come and purify some things, illuminate some things, fuel some things. I need your spirit, oh God, to spur me into unity and unlock the gift of language, the language to interpret the good news to my neighbors and my friends, the prayer language to enrich and to make my life of prayer and fellowship with you more dynamic. The boldness, Lord God, to speak into my everyday situations with the confidence that you are at work. So God, we ask you, Lord, fill us up and speak to our hearts today. God, I pray for my loved ones today, our congregation both in person, online, and beyond. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be a fire that falls from heaven. May it fall into our hearts. May it fill us up from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. And may it, God, give us what we need to be empowered. May it give us what we need, oh God, to be filled with your Spirit. So our daily circumstances, God, can continuously be informed and empowered by your spirit. I pray, God, that you'll bless every family that's represented, every community that's represented, every concern that's represented. I pray, God, that the redemptive work of the world that you are inviting us into, God, will look very plain to us so we can be agents of reconciliation, of unity, of healing, of hope. I pray, God, that it may happen in due time and do it, God, for your glory and your pleasure. Grab a hand of someone next to you, if you don't mind, or touch their shoulder, their, their hand. Or God, I pray for the person I'm touching. I pray, God, that you'll give them a supernatural introduction and experience into the spirit that is your spirit. I pray, God, that wherever they need your power, God, it will show up in abundance. I pray wherever they need your strength, God, it will show up in concrete ways. I pray, God, wherever they need inspiration, Lord God, the practices, wherever they need you to be at work and active, I pray that it will do what your spirit always does, it gives us what we need for every season. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. Bless us, God. Save us and heal us. And we'll say, thank you, Jesus. Glory to you on a day 
where we say this is Pentecost. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them this is Pentecost. Tell them that this is Pentecost. And it is for you. It is for me. It is for us. This is Pentecost. Give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. God bless you. God bless you.